Sorry, guys. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first pr produce uh, webinar with Tony Abbas and Burke Metzger. They are from our produce division up in Canada, in Ontario. So um, they came on. We had a few technical issues. So if Tony's sweating, that's why, because he just came flying in at the last possible second. So <laughs> just as an introduction, my name is Tara Willsworth. I do marketing here at Prospeant. And if anyone has any questions during the course of this webinar, please ask them in the chat. And if they're relevant at the time, I'll ask them out loud and the two guys can answer them. Or if it's something that's not relevant at the time, we can go do a Q&A at the end. We do have a quite a full calendar. So with that, I'm going to get started and hand it over to Burke and Tony. All right, we'll do some brief introductions. I'll let Tony go first. Okay, everybody, I'm the Business Development Director for the Produce Division of Crosspient. Um, happy to be here. Love talking about lettuce and growing in general. All right, I'm Burke Metzger. I'm the General Manager of the Produce Division for Crosspient, and webinars are always fun, so we can't wait to get going here. So I'll briefly walk you guys through the overview of what we're all covering today. Some very generic high level things and a bit more details in some. So why why producing in a greenhouse? A quick cultivation 101. We're going to look at uh, different growing systems uh, for lettuce and leafy greens. We'll take a quick look at uh, greenhouse coverings, curtain systems, and then we dive into the greenhouse environment and the controls thereof. Uh, lighting, the climate control itself with humidity, heating and cooling, and we'll end with food safety and sanitation. So why a greenhouse? Why are we growing in a greenhouse? So um, we have a lot of natural sunlight free of charge and the heat uh, generated also by that uh, sunlight that we can use, use in a protected environment. We Growing indoors, we have less of a contamination risk. So food safety is a big aspect on plant health and safety. We can grow year round in these systems. Obviously the yields are significantly higher per area than compared to the field. There's also a lot higher investment, obviously. We can grow environment more environmentally friendly with these systems. Um, Climate change is a big impact. So all the weather related risks, whether it's severe weather events or weather events not happening as in droughts, um, that is much reduced with these growing systems. We have uh, very much decreased use of water per unit produced. And on the marketing side, we can, <clears throat> uh, we, we can ensure that we have a consistent supply, consistent as in output in tonnage and also in quality. And that's the next bullet point. We improve the crop quality overall. And it's relatively easy to scale. Once you have one of these projects uh, down and systems developed to scale up, we have several operators that are in this mode. Um, once you have it down pat and you understand how they operate, it's, it's easy to scale up. Okay, my turn. So talking about lettuce cultivation, uh, this is generic. So you'll see that there's a range when it comes to all these uh, different processes with regards to creation of lettuce. So seeding usually takes about two days um, and that, that consists of uh, some sort of a germination solution. And there are many, but essentially we wanna make a very comfortable climate for seeds to crack. Um, so seeding takes about two days for, those, for that action to happen. Then we move the plants to a propagation stage where we're actually giving them some water, some nutrients, we're giving them some space to grow. And that's the point where the, the, the now baby plant gets an opportunity to build its roots and, and give itself a base or a foundation for what's coming. And that takes eight to 18 days. And again, this is cultivar dependent, variety dependent. Um, and then we go into cultivation and harvesting. And that takes usually 15 to 21 days. So the kind of the standard, what we talk about is the, 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 the circle takes about 42 days um, to complete, from seed to completion. Um, and in the cultivation stage, I kind of skipped over that a little bit. We usually do a transplanting, depending on the system, uh, and you'll see as we get into this, but we usually we do a transplanting to give the plants space needed for what's, ha what's coming, for their growing as they get bigger and larger. Um, we adjust space and plant density, again, dependent on systems. And then there's obviously the harvesting packaging stage, 
of the product, so taking the plants out of whatever system we're, we're, we're cultivating them in and, you know, doing a harvesting practice and uh, packaging per whatever you may need or however you're going to be distributing your product, and then sanitation of the system. What do we do to bring it all back and to do this again? Mm -hmm. So, Tony, quick question. Uh, on average, these systems, how many rotations per area can you get in a year? So you're, 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 you're estimated roughly around eight turns to nine years, depending, or nine, depending on the system, right? So as we get into it, you'll see, but the mobile gutter system is kind of the one that's, that's taking more popularity in the market because that's the one that you can be consistently seeding, consistently propagating, and consistently harvesting because there's areas dedicated for that. So you can maximize your yield and get more out of your facility with a system like that. Okay. Nope. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I hit the button at the same time. Let's go back to <laughs> there we <laughs> to the go. I'll, sorry. Con I'll control the slides. That's my contribution. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I'm keep, I'm gonna keep my hands off. So uh, let's start with a what most people are probably familiar with with familiar with a deep water culture. That's um, what we call growing on, on on troughs or ponds, also with floating rafts. So some of the system particulars are it's relatively low maintenance, and what we mean by that, once you have the raft populated with your plants, it goes out in the ponds. That's very little mechanics. The stuff actually floats from one side to the other. You're not moving stuff around. There's no gears and uh, and, and a lot of stuff that needs to be maintained. Um, obviously, it grows a lot faster than compared to growing in soil. But I just said, we've got minimal moving parts and assemblies. We have, compared to the other systems we're going to get into, we have a lower capex on, on these systems. They're potentially similar on the front end until we have the rafts planted. But as out in the greenhouse, we have a, it's lower. Um, a little bit higher OPEX because we're, we're dealing with more water treatment and, and higher water volumes that we're treating. Labor requirements a little bit higher because we're moving bigger units around. It's a little less automated than we can do with the other systems. Bit lower production efficiency. Nice part is we have a lot of water volume. We have ample, root for, uh, ample room for root development as long as we control our ponds uh, properly and the water chemistry and the oxygen levels and everything else that goes with it. With that comes, we're dealing with high water volumes. So we are pumping a lot, we're filtering a lot. So there's high filtration requirements to keep those ponds, uh, the, the quality of the water in those ponds the way it should be. It takes up more space. Yeah. And we have lower yields per square foot in, in this system compared to the other ones. Yeah, just to, 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 to chirp, chirp in here a little bit, the, the thing about the deep water culture system, right, it's one of the longest running systems for greenhouse cultivation of lettuce. The thing that I, that I, I want to get across to anybody online here is that that raft has spacing already in it. It's predefined. So the transplanting doesn't happen in this system, meaning you don't take a small plant and put it into its final place to do growing. You have the same amount of space at the propagation stage as you would at the finish stage. So that's where you lose with, the, with this system on a per square foot basis, because we don't do an actual transplant. And you'll see this coming up in the next slides, but because you're, you're, you're stationary, you have the same, that raft is dedicated to find spacings there. You lose out on maximizing how much growing space you have because you're taking these rafts and a lot less density needs to propagate. So that's something that should be known when it comes to deep water culture. Okay, then we talk about the MNFT process. So and, um, NFT nutrient film technology, just so that for the sake of the, the, the people online, um, this is just constant flow or flowing of water through some sort of a gutter or trough and having roots that are exposed to picking up the nutrients in the water as that water flows through. So this was the next step when it came to lettuce cultivation. And essentially in this situation, you're gonna have a spot where you do, well, in most systems, you'll have a spot where you'll do your germination and propagation external to this. And then you'll bring in a propagated seedling or a propagating small, propagated small baby plant, put them inside of this growing, or inside of these stationary gutters and then it stays there. And then that nutrient film will run across that gutter 
And essentially we will let that, this plant cultivate and move from seedling to finished product here. But then you have to understand the manual operations here, right? Yes, someone has to actually manually come place the actual seedling in this gutter. And then when it's done, they have to come to that gutter and remove them from the gutter. And then you do a cleaning process for it. So in this situation, there's obviously lower maintenance because everything's stationary, nothing's moving. It's just water that we're flowing. Uh, it's faster growing compared to soil. There's minimal moving parts, like I kind of said a minute ago. High output because now we can maximize the square footage or maximize the plant spacing in a certain area so we can get the most out of what we're trying to do here in this greenhouse. Um, it's easier to climb the control. So considering a deep water culture, you know, just imagine a, a, a giant river or a giant pond, I guess, in your bay and have any sort of climate, it would have to be coming from above down. So having some sort of conditioning of air, movement of air, whatever it may be has to come down. Uh, in this situation, because there's spaces between the gutters, we can put something from below. So we can push air from below the actual gutters and bring that climate and have better climate control. Uh, there is low water nutrient consumption, higher labor for transplanting harvesting, like I had said, um, greater risk of technical failures, and it's obviously a much lower capex. So you're buying gutters, you're, you're putting a frame up to hold these gutters, and we're running water through them. They don't move. So this is kind of the, the next evolution in creation of lettuce. Why is there a greater risk for technical failures? To be honest with you, I'm not really sure that we shouldn't have been here in this in this one because yeah, there's not much to do. It just place and go. Um, okay. That may have been for another slide. My apologies. Okay, sorry. One risk you have you are running because your NFT right, your water supply needs to be there. That's true. There's no, buff, there's no buffer in there. Once it starts okay. pumping, you got a problem, right? All right. Um, so moving on, the next system up in, in this progression is a, is a moving table system where you basically, in a sense, you have what you had previous minus the NFT <coughs> um, and, and, and you move tables through the greenhouse. Um, we have higher yields. We have reduced labor cost because we have actually have something that moves by itself. And we can manipulate it that way. Um, we have less human uh, interaction decreased chances for contamination and we're, we're kind of maximizing the square footage a little bit there's manual table systems where you push your tables around um, by hand or you can you can automate it so it, it's it's kind of a, a half step between the stationary one and the one that we were we're moving into the on the next slide and when you with the comment about decreasing chances for contamination um, essentially, if there's an issue on one of your tables, then that table is rendered useless or that, that yield on that table is an issue. The rest of the system can still keep on going. Um, then this brings us to the last system that's kind of, uh, it's gaining very much so on the popularity of the cultivation of lettuce. Um, this is the mobile gutter system. So delivery higher yields per square meter. So again, just if you see the picture that's here right now, you're looking at plants in the propagation stage. So in the propagation stage, the space between those gutters is much smaller and the space between the plants are much smaller because they don't need a lot of space. So now you can imagine that you're producing and propagating a lot more plants in a much smaller area. And then you'll know that when it comes to the next stage of this, when we have to transplant those plugs or seedlings into the larger gutter where they have their final dust, uh, uh, separation between them, that's why, that's how you maximize the facility. So you're using a lot less space for propagation, you're building, you're making a lot more plants on a per square meter basis, and that way you're able to fill up almost three quarters of your greenhouse or the rest of that greenhouse with actual cultivation. So this system provides a lot more plants and a lot more yield per square meter. You maximize productivity because this system moves itself autonomously. So when you actually put those plants into these gutters, the system, as it moves along through that propagation stage and the plant dictates the need for more, more air, more space to grow, the gutters actually separate themselves. And as they move along, they make a bigger space between each of the gutters to give the plant the space that it needs. This happens autonomously. Or, uh, and then also for the transplanting, where there's, you know, not, it's not a human being picking up all these plugs at a time and putting them. It's an actual robotic transplanter that we have that would pick up multiple of them anywhere from 10 to 12 at a time and transplant them into their the other gutters so that's 
automated. So the whole process of growing and moving is completely done autonomously. <clears throat> you obviously maximize your greenhouse space. You have the most plants you can put per square meter in a facility like this. Um, minimize water nutrient consumption, right? So this is an NFT solution, meaning we are still doing the same nutrient film technology, moving it along those gutters. And we collect everything that we give to this, these plants so that whatever doesn't get taken up, and it's about 95% of the water we give, doesn't get used, water with fertilizer, but we take that water and fertilizer, bring it through a system where we actually, you know, we sediment filter it, then we sterilize it, we test it, and we will move it back in and reuse it. So it reduces water nutrient consumption, lower, lower electricity and heating costs, um, reduces the need for manual labor. You're, you're, if you want to automate your harvesting solution, you can do so. If not, you would have labor to actually do the harvesting, especially if you're doing head lettuce. Um, but before that, pretty much everything for this system, from the placement of the seeds to the germination process, to the propagation, to the whole, the whole loop of the life cycle of, the, of these plants, it's all, all, all automatic. So there's not a lot of labor in these facilities. Um, it improves your food safety and sanitation. Um, you've got obviously better crop steering. And the, the, the one caveat is there's much more from a, from a CapEx perspective. Um, the going thing is for, for a facility like this, for a, a mobile gutter facility to the tune of five acres, you need five people to operate five acres worth of lettuce cultivation because of the automatic function of this system. So it's a much lower labor, or much much more from a labor perspective, less. So your opex, your inputs are less. So your your plant cost is less. So for a, a different kind of greenhouse that is isn't automated like this, how many people would you need for five acres? Well, if you're doing a manual facility, then you know from what I from what we see, you're looking at anywhere from four to five people per acre. Okay. So, so comparing for the two. Pounds. I think 20 to 25 people compared to five. Okay. This type of a, of a process. Deep water culture is more on the in and the out. So there's much more people, much more labor involved for the in and the out. Um, and then for table systems, it has similar to this, but there's more transplanting and more people needed for watching that process as it goes through. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I just want to chime in for a minute. We had uh, several times when Tony and I have been to facilities where you have the bigger ones, 30 acres of this style greenhouse. And you look around and you see two or four people on the transplant robots. That's all you will see out in the greenhouse. So you have the gutters going in, in the, in the substrate room where the seed gets placed, goes into germination. You have some people there. And then you have them in the harvesting section and almost nobody in the greenhouse. It's, it's really, uh, from a label perspective, it's, uh, it's amazing. Well, you can see in this photo, there isn't a soul around. It's just this sea of little baby lettuces. Yep. Yep. Pretty cool. All right. We'll get into the cover. And Tony, this one is yours. Because yeah, you yeah. So obviously with greenhouses, it, it, all, it literally really comes down to where you're at. But we, we, we do recommend a low iron glass for lettuce because of, well, the benefits. Compared to standard glass, it, it gives you the, the the clarity, color neutrality. You have a higher degree of trans, transparency. So this is a clear low iron glass that we're recommending. Increased light transmission, greater strength and durability, improved energy efficiency, UV and infrared protection, but that's the bigger one there. Allows for UVB light benefits. And that's a big deal for um, lettuce. UVB is, is, is very beneficial for lettuce production. Um, so that's something that low iron glass would give us for these facilities. So I have a question, and this might be a yeah. daft one, but you've got this, this greenhouse image here, which looks to be quite tall. And the previous image, this one showed quite a bit of space between here. Is there, is there a reason that it needs to be so tall? Well, we recommend, so with these gutters, right? If you go back one page, uh, or one slide, you'll see that where the gutters themselves, you're usually about a meter to meter and a half off the ground. Mm -hmm. so what we like in, in our greenhouses and what we like in these structures is the buffer, meaning from that plant to the top of that greenhouse, there's a, a good amount of space. We use that space for climate, for air exchanges, but also to have a buffer between anything from an outside, from an air um, environment perspective and shock to the plants. 
right? So the recommendation to have a higher greenhouse is for air exchanges and to keep the plants in a cozy, comfortable environment at all times. So, yeah. That's you, you have more volume to work with, Tara. So if you would have a lower air volume, your fluctuations in temperature humidity would be way more pronounced than if you work with a bigger volume. It's, you can okay. generate. And that applies to actually all greenhouse okay. crops, right? And as we get into this, you'll see how we use screens to, to help with climate within and using and maximizing outside. You'll also see how we, we control climate for situations like this mobile garter system. That's coming mm -hmm. up. All right. So I know we had a whole webinar on this. Um, when it comes to these kind of systems, an alternate covering to glass. I, we just wanted to mention this, that there's this alternative out there, which is called F-Clean, which is an EFTE roofing system. It's kind of a, a plastic, very durable, lifetime guaranteed light transmission uh, covering that was developed that goes on in a, in a pre-stretch. Because one downfall is with these systems, if you remember back that one picture full of seedlings, if you have glass breakage in, in, in that, that kind of system, you are doing a, a lot of clean out. And for food safety reasons, you, you're really in a pickle because you, you have to run the whole section empty. You've got to get this, uh, get this section out. It's going to get into your gutters and so on and so forth. So in areas... Number one in areas that are prone to see severe weather events and in general, I think there's a lot of advantages and a lot of thought can be given as these systems are now developed, whether you shouldn't consider an F-gain covering for your roof. You have a comparable light transmission. It's energy efficient. It's durable. This is a product that has been used on a, in, in, in a different not, trans, not in its transparent form, in a different form on, on sporting events, soccer stadiums. It's uh, really weather resistant. Um, you, you can see the bullets on the side. We have a very high mechanical resistance against hail. If you're in a seismic, a seismic area where you have earthquakes, obviously it's a big advantage. And last but not least, you're shipping a fraction of the weight if you build one of these projects compared to shipping glass around the corner, uh, around the globe. So uh, also, if something happens, it's fairly easy to repair. It, you can get it in clear, you can get it in diffused. So the systems <clears throat> that you need, the pre stress technology to apply this, it's come a long ways. And I, I really think this is something that we'll see more of in the future. So you mentioned at the beginning of the slide that, that it's a lifetime guarantee. Did you say that? It's a, I, you're not, it's, I'm, I'm going to be careful with the word guarantee, <laughs> but you're expecting to not replace this every three years. You put that on once, it should be good for the lifespan of the greenhouse. Yes, okay. that's the assumption. Yeah, and like to, to harp on the, what he said there, I don't want to let that go without knowing. If you're in an area where you don't have access to um, someone to take care of the greenhouse from a glass perspective, like, you know, there's always the, the chance that glass breaks. Um, having this system you have a cart that comes with the system so you can literally send your people up there and it's basically a patch that you would place if there was issues if there were cuts if there were breaks you can patch and repair this greenhouse yourself so you're not relying on someone to come charge you for a service call and the system itself is like Burke had said it, it moves so if you're in an area where there's high winds or there's an area where there's more hurricanes or hail uh, this is a good a very good solution for your structure Great. Okay, curtains. Well, this this is the um, this is actually getting this is great now. So we we use screening systems in the greenhouse, and we um we move and we use different types of materials to benefit the crop and to maximize um, our value, meaning keeping what we are doing inside the greenhouse if we're heating or cooling to stay within, but then also to keep the uh, the elements away. And there's a lot here, so. We, we, there's a very big push for uh, the, a par perfect or like a par concept. And I apologize for using a, a trademark name, but par, meaning we want to make sure that the light level at the plant is consistent at all times. <clears throat> so with that, we use screening systems. So if we put a clear roof on your structure, um, then and we add lighting into the facility for supplemental purposes um, for cultivation of lettuce, we use a light abatement screen, which is the top screen. And what that is basically is it keeps the light within the facility. And then we also we use a, a, a two screen system below. 
an energy and an open shade current. And it can be either or here. We can also use a one screen. So it's one uh, wire bed, one actual screen system, but with a cloth on both sides or different material on both sides. So you can see just from the diagram there in that center, we can pretty much do a lot inside the structure. So if we want to keep the energy in and bring the sun out, we would you know, open the light abatement screen, let that sun come through so we benefit from the light, but keep the heat out and keep the heat within because of the energy screen. You know, for the open shade curtain, that would be used to diffuse more. So we can take that light that's coming in and we can scatter that sun. And if we want to reduce the amount of light coming in because there may be too much sun or it's, it's, not, it's not what the plant wants, then we can actually use that light abatement screen to reduce the amount of sun coming in and then take the open screen to, to, to scatter it. So there's many options of how we manipulate the environment within using screening systems. So um, I kind of ventured off the points, but we manage light levels, kind of touched on that, we regulate humidity and temperature. It obviously keeps the energy consumption at, a, at the least amount possible for efficiencies. We reduce heat loss, provides the extra insulation, and then you can also uh, um, manipulate day length. And then so the different materials that we use, like I had stated, diffusement, energy screens, light abatement screens. Uh, it all comes down to where you are, what you're growing, what crop you're going to go with. And this gets very more specific, but this is what we're seeing more and more for lettuce cultivation. All right, let's talk about lighting for a minute. So previous slide, Tony talked about keeping the light levels uh, steady with manipulating the curtains and then co controlling power. So obviously there's the fact of additional lighting because uh, we want to use as much sunlight as we can, but we also have seasons and we want to grow year round. So what does lighting do? Obviously it provides energy for the plants so we can enhance plant growth. It, it is instrumental for photosynthesis. So obviously um, we are extending the, the period where the plant is photoactive. Uh, yield will we improve yields. We can grow year round. Um, it impacts quality of the crop and weight, obviously. So lights, we broke it down in, in three simple things. We have a quanti the quantity um, with that basically how long are we lighting and we have the quality of the light. So quantity or intensity impacts root growth, shoot development, growth rates, certain colorings, certain um, contents of the plant, um, duration, how long the photo period is that impacts, you know, if there's a flowering uh, uh, desired, it, it, you can control that with it. The actual growth, the yield and the growth rate and then the quality of the light itself, the spectrum, it impacts morphology, leaf shape. There's a lot of research being done on this. Um, it impacts taste, it impacts color, all, all, all kinds of things. Um, quality, shelf life. So there is, there is uh, a whole uh, area of research and, and new uh, knowledge that comes to light every day that, that um, is, is a very important factor to an, to an efficient high output growing system. Yeah, and, and to touch on that, like we're, we're scratching the surface, right? And only until recently has cultivation of uh, lettuce been more and more proper within a greenhouse. And with that, you can obviously play with different types of spectrum, different types of intensity. So um, there's a lot of different light suppliers out there, but you're seeing a lot of light suppliers going into a spectrum changing. So a spectrum customization where you can literally change the spectrum you're applying via these lights and then an intensity. So you can dim these lights as well. So um, if you're looking at doing something like this, try and look, try and, and focus or try and put the effort into in finding a light that has those benefits. Meaning you can change that spectrum and change the intensity. Because again, we're only learning as we go and you're always, it's always gonna get different. You're always gonna get new techno or new information and that way you have the ability to, to change on the fly and be able to take advantage of whatever comes. So prior to this, it was all um, field growing, correct? Yeah, mostly field growing. There were, there, were, there were certain people, there are certain entities that have been doing it for, for a time, but they were doing it with the, the previous practices like the deep water culture. Mm -hmm. and recently has the mobile gutter system become more and more popular. Okay. Yeah, so once you put it in the greenhouse, you can do a lot more because yeah. now everything's at your fingertips. So it's there's a lot coming. 
Mm-hmm. And then we talked about different types of lighting, right? And I kind of touched on it a minute ago. Um, what was the, 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 the one that was the most popular in the industry was a high pressure sodium light. And a high pressure sodium light was um, one that came in for vegetable cultivation. Uh, it gave off a lot of heat. It basically mimicked the spectrum of the sun. And there's benefits too, and depending on where you are, is, is where we recommend and wouldn't recommend this light, right? So um, high pressure sodium has a lower input cost. It does take, take more to operate. It does give off heat. Uh, it has a shorter lifespan. And um, uh, you're, again, fixed light spectrum. And there is a risk of leaf burn depending on where it is relative to the crop. LEDs is it's it's just constantly changing. It's there are many different suppliers, many different systems, many 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 different inputs. Um, fixtures can be placed closer to plants. Uh, you can again the customization of spectrum, um, emit focused lighting so you can direct that lighting. Uh, there is more from a capex up front that's getting better, but it is more than an HPS light. But obviously, it takes a lot less to operate it. You don't have to worry about heat radiation, which again is good for lettuce, um, and depends on where you are and longer lifespans. So, depending on where you are, we we could possibly recommend a checkerboard where we put part HPS lights and part LED lights, right? So, if we want to take advantage of you know the heat that comes off the HPS lights in the winter time, we would run them, or we could run them in tandem. So, it's about you know thinking about your location. We have to know where you want to grow, what you want to grow, and then we customize our recommendations on what you should do or what we'd recommend you should do for the best out of your facility. There are also rebates offered for LEDs as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a regular thing now. It's available both in Canada and, and the U.S. Um, usually the programs open and close at certain times of the year, but just because of what we're in now, yes, there are significant uh, rebates available for all right now we're getting into climate control so i always call this this is a, a generation x or advanced climate control that we see in a lot of the lettuce greenhouses whereas in a normal vine crop greenhouse in, in moderate climates we're, we're venting we're screening we're heating and that's kind of the end of it we don't have uh, a lot of uh, capital tied up in installations to to, to uh, control, for example, humidity contents in the greenhouse or actively cool the greenhouses. So when it comes to lettuce, uh, there is normally, and Tony will get into the nuts and bolts of this in, in a little bit, there's normally more complex systems where we can work with exterior interior air, mixing thereof, where we can actively control humidity and where we have a cooling uh, loop where we can also re actively reduce the temperature outside of venting in the greenhouse to to work in a narrower band and, and maintain very uh, <coughs> stable ideal uh, climate conditions so humidity humidity and temperature we're controlling the air exchanges the air distribution there's quite often systems with slurves or uh, other means of dividers that we, we distribute the air the way we want it. It's not just, you know, convection and opening the vents. Um, it could include a climate corridor with a pad wall and so on and so forth. So there's, there's different ways of, of doing this, but it is definitely in a lot of applications a lot more complex than what you see in a normal line crop greenhouse. Yeah, and essentially, like, we, before we, we pivot from this slide, there's a lot of information in that diagram. And, like, lettuce cultivation, uh, especially lately like that the 24 hour temperature is what's beneficial to lettuce right so it's the tightness of the actual heads or tightness of the leaf the crisp the the the, the taste of the product itself so you put a lot of money into the facility to uh, maintain an optimal climate for this production so the system you see in front of you is a mix of of, of everything meaning if the outside conditions are beneficial for us meaning if outside that greenhouse the air is cooler um, it's a better temperature the humidity is lower, then we want to bring that air in. But we don't want to do that. We can't do that by just opening up vents. We want to bring it in. So we use, if you see the first, the very top part there, you have the one opening. That brings in outside air into our climate corridor. So consider a picture of a box within the greenhouse itself. So now we're bringing an outside air into that corridor. That's air coming in. We use an air mixer, which you can kind of see that box with the X's, uh, the blue and the red X's. We basically would rotate that air 
and give that conditioned air, which is a mix of both the greenhouse air, because you'll see that greenhouse inlet air, air uh, vent opening at the top. So we bring in that air, we bring in outside air, we mix that air, and we can bring that now conditioned air into the greenhouse and push it through those gigantic slurves. So we put a very big fan unit, we, we input some cooling and heating coils, so that way now, if we wanted to mechanically cool and air condition the greenhouse essentially, we can do that using our air handling unit. If we like the outside temperature, we can just use that air handling unit to push and use the fan capacity of that unit and actually not active cool. If we like what's in the greenhouse itself, we can just rotate that air. If we want just what's from the outside, we can bring in just from the outside and push that air through. So this climate corridor concept is more or less the easiest way for us to reduce as much as possible what you put into creating your lettuce. So it just act, it basically uses whatever we can to reduce that opex. And I think I touch, we touch on it more in the following slides. Um, there are other options here, right? So pivoting from the, the actual active cooling of the system, there are other ways that you can use um, what you have available in technology for greenhouse cultivation today, again, depending on location, right? So there's, de there's dehumidification systems where you kind of see two different pictures up there, right? The first one is, is if you can picture above the screening system when a screen is closed, right? What's above or sorry, what's outside of the greenhouse itself, the temperature and the humidity will be less because the greenhouse effect and obviously the transpiration from plants. So we use the upper system to bring in that dehumidified or we'll call it less humid air from outside the structure and bring it into the structure. And then on the left hand side, you'll see another concept where above the screens, if you use your active venting within the greenhouse and your screens are closed, then the, the climate where the peaks are with that venting is usually going to be less than what the temperatures in the greenhouse again, because of the greenhouse effect. So we use, um, if you can kind of see in the middle there, there's a faded one. That's the jet that pulls the air from above the screen down. And then we use, you know, neighboring fans to recirculate that condition or that dehumidified lower temperature air within the plant, within the crop and within the facility. Another way to do some cooling is misting systems, which is the adiabatic cooling effect. So we add um, a water mist into the, the facility and we basically, we're using, um, I guess you can say we're using cold water to air from the greenhouse. These are dependent on where your location is and what your outside environment is. So it just shows that there are many different ways we can play with the climate and get it as effectively as we can within the structure um, for your, your cultivation needs. Is this you, Burke? I think this is yours. I, was, I muted myself. I'm sorry. So quick, quick word about heating and, and, and cooling, how... How we do that, I think uh, a lot of you guys online are probably familiar with the fact that um, we, we have the actual heat or cooling source. We get into cooling a little bit more, which is either your boiler or your mechanical chiller or absorption chiller, um, which would make cold or hot water on demand. But because we have fluctuating system demands, we normally add a storage tank. That's a picture in the middle. So we can on the heat portion, we can use the CO2 coming off the boiler when we need the CO2, store the heat that's generated during that time frame when we might not need the heat in the tank, and also build buffer capacity in the tank, which will allow for a smaller boiler footprint to, to meet the needs of uh, for, to address peaks in, in the heating installation. We do similar things on the cooling side where we then, instead of a hot water storage tank, we got a cold water storage tank to provide the cooling capacity if needed. So the capacity is actually in that storage tank where the chiller continuously runs uh, the cold water into. So on the heating, we got the CO2 to deal with in the buffer tank. On the cooling, we're making chilled water. We have, uh, when we'll get into this, two different kinds of chillers normally, or three different kinds. We got mechanical, uh, water cooled, air cooled, and absorption chillers. Um, and we'll have a quick word about that because we feel this is an area when it comes to chilling efficiency that is there's a lot of work that can be done and where we need to have a lot deeper understanding how this all works to come up with the most efficient solution. Yeah, like that's a great segue. It, it, and I've said it a couple of times in this presentation. It, there is no um, 
all in one simple plug and play solution for these facilities. That just doesn't exist. So we, when we work with the customer, we work with our, 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 our clients, we wanna make sure that we're specific to the area. So as we touched on before in the previous slide, there's many different ways to do active cooling and create cold water and then obviously creating hot water. If we had a facility that was further south, like in Florida or Texas, you know, we'd put in a chiller that has the that has a heat pump as an offset. So in the process of creating cold water, we can take hot water from the actual process of that creation and bring that efficiency. What we focus on is the efficiencies, is the OPEX. Because as this market expands and more and more people start producing lettuce and the market becomes more competitive, the, the, the make or break is the input cost, the cost per unit, the cost per gram, the cost per ounce. So we try and maximize that. Depending on where you're located, depending on, on what you pay for your utilities, if you're getting um, peak savings at certain times of the day where you can run your units and take advantage of lower electricity rates, then we would recommend obviously having a mechanical cooler, uh, a mechanical chiller, I mean, creation of that cold water when it's the best from a price perspective, storing said cold water in a storage tank, and then when it's not the greatest from a cost perspective to produce, we can take what's in that buffer tank and what's in our storage tank and use it as needed in the facility. Same thing when it comes to the heat, as Burke had just said, right? In the summertime or springtime, you want CO2 because that obviously makes your plant bigger. It makes them uptake and, and be more active. Right? So we want to run that CO2 in the winter, or we want to run the boiler in the summertime. We don't need hot water during the day. So if we turn on that boiler, we create the hot water, we store that hot water, so that we can take what we need from the hot water, meaning the CO2, we can distribute it to the farm, and here we are. We're storing that hot water. On a, another option, which is something that I, we did case specific for a, a specific customer, is we offered absorption chilling where with absorption chilling, you utilize the, the waste heat to create cooling capacity. So essentially that creation of hot water for CO2 needs would then be turned into cold water at a very low, a very high efficient rate. So now you're basically taking the byproduct of creating CO2, depending on where you are, um, and using it to create cold water as needed to active cool the greenhouse. So you can, uh, like you can see, decoupling of CO2 heat generation. That's kind of the process of how this absorption works. Right, so heated liquid boils, vaporizes, cooling gases condenses, the pressure reduction lowers boiling point, and heat flows from warmer to cooler surfaces, and essentially make cold water in that absorption process. Um, so, you know, the operational savings are kind of what we, we hinted at. And I think if you go to the next slide, I believe it's the next slide, it shows the actual calculations. Uh, one more slide, sorry, that's just the picture. Yeah, so I, this is the example I gave to this customer, where the customer is concerned about CO2. Right, so we told we we basically did the calculation for them that the, the, the cost to to operate an absorption chiller, and again, this was dependent on a certain state and a certain rate. Um, but that cost was ten thousand five hundred for a year. What you wanted, as in how much you needed from a CO two perspective, on a daily basis, of what could be given to you supply wise, and then what kind of gas you consume to create that. In that facility, okay, at seven seventy one USD per day. The savings to, to run that gas, it costs roughly $1,000 a day to burn the natural gas, meaning create CO2, and then to take that into a absorption chiller. But that, that cost is what we're talking about here. So running that boiler, giving us CO2 and putting it through an absorption chiller costs us $1,000 a day to actually do the process and get the CO2 we need it. If we were going to buy liquid CO2 and bring it to the site, you're looking at $4,200 a day. So the savings came in at $3,200 a day by putting an absorption chiller into this individual's facility. So again, it's case specific to the area and to the demands. And we get very granular when it comes to these, these, these types of conversations. And this is a big one now. Yes, so I'll take a little bit of that and then Tony, you can dovetail into it again. So food safety and sanitation. Um, is big. <clears throat> That's one of the reasons why we see increased demand for what you see in these pictures to, to come out of a greenhouse and not necessarily out of the field. It's um, the surety of supply, the quality of supply, and the food safety aspect of it. So the systems themselves are very food safe, but with that goes the emphasis to keep the system safe and need to know what, what you're doing there because um, 
you saw there, it's a system that's elevated up the ground. There are spaces underneath. You have all the gutters to deal with and so on and so forth. So what we have seen in several project layouts is actually the involvement of the offtake partner of the customer that buys the system from us to say, hey, we want to see this system that you're installing there. Do you have a food safe solution to clean the gutters, to make sure there's no, uh, you know, getting all the nooks and crannies, there's no green algae residue anywhere? There's a lot of input from your guys out there that end up taking this stuff and putting it on a burger or do something with it. So when it comes to the cleaning process, um, give it enough thought. Is the system amenable to pass these food safety regulations? You might be passing a an audit, <clears throat> but a lot of these offtake partners have specific requirements that they want to see to the point that they might even tell you, hey, we don't really support the system. We want you to do something other or convince me that you can actually run it that way. So plant debris underneath this whole thing, the way to clean and sterilize the gutters, all the surfaces and the equipment, can it be disinfected? Can it be cleaned? You will see all this uh, harvesting, cutting and seeding equipment. Normally food grade stainless, there's nothing painted, there's nothing mild steel, there's nothing rusty. You all, most of you will know that from operating in the greenhouse environment makes stuff expensive, but that's what it's there. Um, the reservoirs in the ground, if you need it, you're dealing with retention tanks, buffer tanks, all this stuff, and all the filtration, the backwash, there is a really, a, 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 as clean as these systems look from the outside, there is a, a really a serious focus on how do we clean it, can we clean it, and can we, can we comply with all the requirements that are out there. And all of these, all the cleaning processes, that's a manual process, right? You've got no automation there. No, the cleaning can be automated because it's a step in the production system. But when it comes to the, the, the bigger things, um, this is uh, very much a yeah. manual process. Yeah, what well, Burke is bringing to the surface, right? Our, our, as this market has increased and as there's been so many different suppliers and producers of lettuce, leafy greens, cut greens, whether it be sanitized and clean, ready to eat or not, uh, the scrutiny is now coming, right? So the offtake customers, the bigger, the bigger companies that are selling to actual customers, um, they're, they're, they're tightening a bit of a grip, right? So you're in the media, you're hearing about this theory outbreaks, you're hearing about other situations at certain facilities. What Burke is saying is you need to think this thing through very thoroughly because wherever you're going to produce your plant, there's going to be food safety you have to abide by. And then on top of that, your marketer or the person taking your product is going to have stringent requests as well. That could include testing of every batch before you send it to us to make sure it doesn't have anything that it shouldn't have, essentially. So when we say take things into consideration, if you're looking at a letter system and there are many different customers, many different companies that are pro providing these mobile gutter or other letter system, think it through when it comes to how you're going to sterilize and how you should separate different practices. Something as simple as when we do in the mobile gutter system, for example, we have a propagation area and then we have an actual cultivation area, meaning small plants and, and large plants, you know, separate them. That's a different watering system. It can be a different feed. You can worry that way you're not working from a contamination perspective. If you have a closed loop system that's going to clean your actual gutters, make that its own separate system. Don't have that where we're using similar water for other practices or we're taking the water we're using to wash the gutters and put them into cultivation after a couple of sterilization or sediment uh, filtration options. Think everything through separate. We have to separate because the scrutiny is coming. Just like we see in vegetables where it's been basically scrutinized to the nines and now we know every single detail of how we produce a tomato, a cucumber, a pepper, an eggplant. They've been done and done. Lettuce is still a new crop. It's a very popular one that's taking a lot of market share, but you've got to be conscious of the fact that food safety and sterilization is a big deal. So just be conscious of when you make decisions. And just don't take because <laughs> that always strikes me and I want to bring up this example. Don't take just because it's done in Europe. At, you yeah. know, this is applicable to us. We've been in large leading facilities where if you look at this picture that's up right now and you, you picture along this post row that's there, a elevated walkway across the top of the crop potentially even perforated, perfectly okay in Europe. Nobody blinks an eye. You start doing this on this side of the pond in Canada and the U.S., <laughs> it's an absolute no-go. 
Yeah. So your whole, if you have a tightly packed in system, your whole uh, movement from A to B, from left to right for your maintenance guys, you might have to think about a little different layout than what they customarily do over there, because there is definitely a, a different standard. Yeah. It's being applied over here. Very, very much so. Very, very much so. There is a question in the chat from our friend Jacob Carson. Hi, Jason. Jacob. Um, his question is, are certain growing systems like raft tray versus gutter channel better for certain lettuce products? For example, head lettuce versus loose leaf spring mix. Um, his question is, what is your recommendation for someone who wants to bo grow both head lettuce and loose leaf blends, ideally using the same growing system? That's right down Tony's alley. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have. I've, I've had this conversation on multiple times, right? Like when it comes to um, what the system's for, I still I push the mobile gutter systems because you can use the mobile gutter system to produce head lettuce, teen lettuce, and baby lettuce, and because that whole entire gutter moves, and because we circulate and rotate through the whole facility, you can take it to whatever harvesting practice you want. So if it's cut, you can cut right off that gutter and then take that gutter through a sanitation and sterilization process. If it's head, you're popping those head lettuces out and you're putting them in whatever packaging you're doing. And then that gutter goes back to the same sterilization or separate sterilization and sanitation process. Um, I would recommend a mobile gutter system mostly because of the maximization of your square footage. Nothing compares to this. You know, if you were going to make some uh, changes, you know, there's, there's concepts and ideas around doing the, the germination and the propagation in some sort of a vertical concept where because it's such a high density of plants, you might want to go vertical. I, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of that for germination. I am not for propagation because there's an acclimation stage the plant needs. So I would prefer the propagation within the facility itself. But from a, a pound for pound, bang for your dollar, yield per square meter, um, autom automation of low labor input costs, Mobile gutter systems is by far the way I would push my customers, for sure. And the mobile gutter, when you said earlier, that's that's fairly new technology, right? Or is it? No, no. So in Europe, the, the, these technologies were created in, in the European market. And the reason they did it, actually, was because they didn't want to bend down on the floor anymore and pick up the plants off the ground, right? So we, we've had the opportunity um, and the honor to meet the people that created this concept. And the reason behind the creation of the concept, and it was 30 years ago that they did this. And it's evolved since then, <clears throat> obviously. But yeah, essentially, they just were tired of bending down to, to harvest their lettuce off the ground. Why can't we bring it up? And mm -hmm. then this turned what we're in now. So no, they exist. The systems exist. There's a lot of new systems right now that are coming into the market. You know, um, we don't stand behind one. Uh, we, we give our opinion, customer choice. Um, I always caution people on the side of, of caution, right? You're spending a lot of money to put these systems into your farm. You're gonna use this system. Um, taking a new system that's been recently created that hasn't been better, that hasn't gone through the ups and downs, the, the lows and highs, is it's it's something to be cautious about. So if you, if you push past the smoke and mirrors and you really analyze what the system can do, meaning that input and output, and, and, and use that common sense, you're, you're, you're going to find that they're almost all the exact same and you want to partner up with a, with someone that's been doing it for a while or that has the background or that will at least, very at least, offer constant support and um, you can help with them. Okay. All right. Well, there are no more questions in the chat. Um, if anybody does have any questions, oh, wait, we do have one. Um, how do you scout for pests and diseases with some of the automated lettuce growing systems? So that's where we push that access on the side. So if you're if you're if you're looking at these systems from a uh, in the facility perspective, um, you want to have a walkway in every house so you can be able to go up and down. Because if you're not, then you're going to go above, right? So we talk about gantry systems, something that's going above the actual crop. And you'll basically have to have an eye on it. So you have to have vision to the system. And those are the only two ways in this in these types of lettuce systems. Do people use drones in any way? Uh, it's coming. Like it's, it's a technology that's coming. There's a lot of 
a lot of camera systems that are available, a lot of them that are coming into the industry. And again, like I said before, um, this is such a new crop still for greenhouse production that there's been a lot more invested into it from all sides. Mm -hmm. But yes, there are like computer or sorry, camera systems that are, are able to scan from a high level, be able to detect deficiencies and given getting as granular as, as you know, pests and issues for the crop itself. Uh, but they don't exist to our knowledge yet. It's still um, use the eye, see the plant. Um, yeah. And in, in the one screen that you were talking about, airflow and all that sort of stuff, you have insect netting, right? So it's not just open air that comes through. So you're not getting the bugs from the outside, you're keeping those out, is that correct? Yeah, oh yeah. We, put, we, we definitely recommend netting on your, on, your, uh, on your venting, right? So we want to try and keep anything from the outside, uh, anything outside coming in, right? And again, uh, still is a new crop, a lot of new varieties, there's constantly new ones coming, so you don't know what someone might be growing next door to you that may have a pest that only likes to eat lettuce, yeah. and then you can have a, an issue pretty quickly. So yeah, we recommend insect netting for sure on our vent openings, so that way we keep everything out. Mm -hmm. All right. So if anybody does have any questions, Burke and Tony are available by email. Um, we will um, we will continue our series as well. We will have another one in February, I believe, with both Tony and Burke, which is the topic is what to consider when purchasing a greenhouse for leafy greens. So it's similar to this, but not quite. I mean, from what Burke said, it's, it can be its whole to separate topic. So we're going to be producing that one in February. And then throughout the year, we'll have different topics from our commercial team retail team, produce, as well as our cannabis team will continue that whole series. So keep an eye on our webinar channel and we'll send out emails to remind you and also on social media. So thank you very much. I'm never going to look at lettuce in the eye again after this. And um, I'm also quite hungry because that looks really good. So <laughs> thank you, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for coming, everyone. We'll thank you. you.